All right. Welcome to week two. Hopefully today's lecture doesn't go right to the end like last week. Um, the last little bit that I did not cover last week, I decided to... Um, I decided to push back till next week uh, because next week's lecture is a little shorter than this week's and really you don't need it for another week anyways so I decided to just push it back. Um, a few things you should be aware of. Now, those who have not shown me lab one yet, uh, as I've told three people already before the class started, please just take a screenshot of the three windows attach it to Blackboard, and I will grade it. If you're having technical difficulties, please come to your assigned lab or one of the other lab times and I will help you. Um, this week you should be working on lab two. Duh. Week two, lab two. It kind of works hand in hand, at least for the first little while. Um, I also didn't announce last week that you should be starting with the hybrids. Uh, the CSI has a typo on it, and I'm aware of it. I just haven't updated it. Um, it said hybrid two, and then the next week says hybrid two. I think we're all old enough to figure out that it was supposed to be hybrid one. Um, or you can do hybrid two, then hybrid one. I don't care. But essentially, uh, if you check your calendar, you'll see when all things do for this course. And essentially, you need to get the first four hybrids done before the end of June. Essentially, you got four weeks and you got four hybrids. Um, once again, the assigned reading and the hybrids are to help you get ready for the exam. I take the time in the lectures to teach you the practical aspects of what you've been reading. I will use some similar terminology. You'll see some words you've seen in there applied to the lectures, but I will not regurgitate the textbook to you. Uh, it's a waste of your time. It's a waste of my time. Uh, the reason I'm taking that approach is it's a standardized exam for this course, essentially. Um, it's a very specific set of questions. It's not the exact same exam as the previous term, but you know, the concepts are the same on every exam. Um, thus, you know, you have to learn the same material as everybody else previous to you. And therefore, that's the point of the required reading is to get you up to snuff for the exam. Um, that's what the required readings for. That's what the hybrids are for. That's what the tests are for. My lecture time in the labs are to get to give you the practical knowledge to actually use the stuff that you're reading. Yes. It is entirely up to you. I'd recommend to read um, lockstep with the lecture, either before or after is fine. But if as long as you're reading it roughly at the same point in time as I'm covering the material, it'll they'll reinforce each other essentially. Uh, the first two hybrids have to do with all the terminology and with some of the diagramming concepts, which is terminology is last week and diagramming concepts start this week. Thus, it's a good time to do the first two hybrids. Uh, they go lockstep. Uh, the hybrids are multiple guesses. So you, you read the, the material, you do the test. Uh, if I remember it, I've got them set, you get two tries. So you try it once, it's okay. Try it a second time, you do worse, well, that, you know, it keeps you a better grade. At least that's how I have it set, or I had it set. All right. That takes care of the announcements, because we haven't been doing a whole lot yet, so there's not that much left to discuss. I was just catching up to the odds and ends that I hadn't done last week. So this week, we're going to start talking about entity relationship diagrams, ERDs. Specifically, today, I'm going to focus on the conceptual diagrams. Uh, next week will be the logical and the physical. Um, when you're diagramming databases, there are three kinds of diagrams. Conceptual, logical, and physical. Conceptual, this basically you illustrate what the entities are and how they're interconnected. So you understand the relationships between the different kinds of data in a given situation. That's its purpose. The logical means it's the next step after the conceptual, where you are starting to assign more detail, you're defining the relationships more clearly. And then the physical is where you take the logical, 
And in the logical, you should have all your fields defined and everything. When you go to physical, you're actually defining it based on the physical aspects that your database server supports. Different database servers have different data types. When you're diagramming, you target whatever database server you're working against, and you use its data types. Some of them are global, but some of them aren't. So that's the, the physical aspect of it. And by the time you get to the physical side of diagramming, you end up with a uh, very specific naming conventions, whereas at the conceptual side, everything's kind of loose and free. So one side's more artistic and one side's very scientific. The one in the middle is where you know the two sides have a conversation over coffee. Okay, so the objective today is to define the terms related to modeling. And again, we've discussed entity and entity instance, but we're going to discuss it in regards to diagramming. Um, cardinality and primary keys. We're going to describe the modeling process, how to draw an ERD, and then how to recognize the various things. So when you're talking about data, how to recognize the different pieces of it. Okay, the database model. A database can be modeled as a collection of entities and a relationship amongst entities. Those are the two pieces that make up a, a modern database system. When the modern database system was designed, it was known as an RDBMS, Relational Database Management System. Relations, that's where the R comes from. Uh, database servers are useless without relations. Just like any data is useless without knowing how it's all interconnected. Um, because, well, if you don't know how things are connected, you can't get decent real information out of it. Um, database systems are often modeled using an entity relationship diagram as the blueprint for how the data is going to be stored. And how the data is stored is the final output of the design phase. So that means you go through the, the three design steps, and when you're done, you end up with a structure that can contain data. It's a pretty straightforward concept. You draw, you draw again, you draw some more, and suddenly you've got a database. How does that happen? The, that last step's a bit magical. Uh, well, it seems magical now. It won't be by the time you're done. Okay, now, ER diagrams allow us to sketch database designs. So that means you can quickly sketch out what the database should look like. It's a graphical tool for modeling. Humans understand pictures usually better than words. Our brains have evolved, but not that far, that we can't translate a written page into a concept very easily. Uh, most people, at least from my experience, will often sketch out you know, a brain map or a, you know, a brain dump, or they'll even, when people are discussing things, They'll, they'll actually draw on a page, you know, they'll write a couple of words and draw a line to another couple of words. You're modeling the information coming at you, real time. It's great for taking notes. It really sucks when you have to apply it in a structured manner, because at that point your brain's still loose. And the point of this process is to take your loose ideas and filter them down to something concrete. Um, ERDs are widely used in database design. Uh, if somebody designs a database and they didn't do a single diagram, there's, they're going to have problems. Why? Because they won't be able to visualize. The tools allow you to visualize. The diagramming lets you visualize. If you can't visualize it, then you probably don't understand all the implications of what you're looking at. Um, ERDs are the graphical representation of the logical structure of the database. Now, i got to be careful here. I'm using the word logical, not physical. Logical means these are the pieces that make this up, the logical chunks. So when you want to describe a complete profile for a person, the logical chunk you're talking about, the person itself, has him or herself, maybe their address, where do they work? You know, what's their educational profile? And I'll look at a person's resume. Look at all the bits and pieces that go on a resume. Those are all pieces of data. Um, those are logical connections, not the physical description. Those are the logical connections of things. Logical means you're looking at it at a very high level abstract. Not a lot of detail, just how are things connected. Uh, anybody here ever have to look at an organization chart? Yeah? Well, 
picture this as an organization chart for your database. Well, with a, I'm using that as a really abstract kind of comparison. Uh, but the difference between a logical and physical at this point would be their titles. Uh, each person has a different job, therefore they're different instances of an attribute. But in an organ, I'm just using that as an example of you know a simple diagram that shows how things are connected logically. When you're talking about data, you're talking about different kinds of objects that are interconnected. Um, when I start drawing the board, you'll, it'll make more sense. Um, the ERD is also a model that identifies the concepts or the entities that exist in the system and how are they interconnected. Uh, when, I, when you start seeing the little bits and pieces of the diagram up on the screen and on the board, it'll start making more sense. Okay. An ERD serves multiple purposes. Um, it allows the designer to have a better understanding of the information to be contained in the database. Believe it or not, database designers are not omniscient. We don't know everything that's happening. You know, somebody goes off on a vision quest, comes back and says, I need a database that does this. Well, that's going to take me a couple of hours to diagram. Why do you need the diagram? Because I don't know. I don't know what's in it. I got a diagram so I can see all the implications of what you're talking about. I need to draw pictures. Um, it also serves as a documentation tool. And you can use it to communicate the logical structure to the database to users. Where I work, we charge four hours of labor for every database diagram I do for a customer. Why? Because we can give them a diagram and they look and they go, that makes sense to me. Then that's what the conceptual diagram is for. It's more for the end user. They don't care about the physical attributes of the database. They just want to make sure they understand that all their bits and boodles are all contained inside the database. And they'd like to know roughly how things are contained and how you see things as being connected. And it's happened in the past where I've given a, a conceptual diagram to a customer. And they looked at it and go, why is this connected to that? Well, that's what I got from your description. No, 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 no. And it's actually this way. And then you go and you redo the diagram. And it makes more sense. Then you look at the sentence they wrote and it makes more sense. The diagramming tool allows you to understand what's happening behind the scenes. It allows you to understand the implications of what is involved in the database at the other end. That's a tool for understanding. All right. The attribute, the components of an ERD. And that looks so good on my screen, it looks so bad on the projector. Uh, if you, it's on Blackboard, so you should be able to suck it down and look at it, then just tag along with me. Um, an ERD has basically four graphical components. It has an entity. Okay, once again, what is an entity? It's an object. It's a thing. It's a person. It's a place. It's something. A relationship. It's the connection between two things, right? The connection right now between me and you guys is I teach you. You learn from me. Learn from the connection. Teach is the connection. Yeah, they're the connection between two entities, and it has a description. Cardinality. Cardinality is essentially, you know, can I have more than one student? Can you guys have more than one teacher for a given course? That kind of stuff. What's the rules of how they're related? Can a child have more than one mother? Biologically, no. Can a mother have more than one child? Biologically, yes. Well, usually. That's cardinality. Attributes. Attributes are the description of the things that make up a thing. <laughs> hey, okay. For example, a person is a thing. Attributes of a person would be your name, your date of birth, your address, what your sex, your hair color, your height. We don't discuss weight. I know. <laughs> you know. So being said, those are attributes that describe something. So the things you use to describe something are the attributes of an entity. Those are the four pieces that you find on a conceptual ERD. When you get to the physical side, this is called, a, number one's a table, number two's a relationship, 
Number three, still cardinality. Number four, fields. So once you get to the physical side, some of these things change names, even though they're the exact same thing. They just suddenly at some point, they just change names. Uh, I don't know if anybody here has ever worked in an industry where, you know, the meaning of something change, the word that describes something changes as you as it goes through a certain process. You know, you take a two by four and it's now a it's now a stud because it's holding up a wall, even though it probably was on the ground. It's a two by four because it's now been attached to a supporting wall. It's now a stud. Go figure. Okay. This is a little bit of review from last week, which is good. Classifications of relationships. These are actually same concept with slightly different wording. An optional relationship. For example, an employee may or may not be assigned to a department. Somebody just got hired, and we're not sure where they're going to be working. Don't laugh. That happens. We've got a flow to work right now where we don't really know where to slot them in because they're good at more than one thing. So we haven't picked a, a department for them yet. They may or may not be assigned to a department. Or in my case, I'm assigned to two different departments. Go figure. IT and engineering. A patient may or may not be assigned to a bed. For example, um, for example, person goes to the ER. They're going to be admitted. Then they spend 20 hours on a bed in the hall. I know someone who went through that experience. While they waited for a bed to be freed upstairs. 20 hours. Don't go to the Civic. <laughs> go to the Queensway. They're faster for finding beds there, apparently. Uh, but 20 hours sitting out in the hall, right? At that point in time, they're a patient that's been admitted, but they have not been assigned a bed yet. So that's an optional relationship. <laughs> Mandatory relationship. Every course must be taught by at least one teacher. Can you imagine showing up for a course and there's no teacher? Actually, that's happened. Uh, I've seen that happen. Um, and that teacher became me when they had to fill in the slot, but they didn't have a teacher. Uh, every mother, nah, that's wrong. I don't know why they wrote like that. Every child has to have at least a mother. Um, oh, yeah, but what happens if you adopted? Yeah, you have a child, but yeah, you know, there's no biological side of it, right? Yes, a mother must have a child because kids can't be called a mother unless you have a child. Fine, you can't be called a father unless you have a child either. There. Okay, guys, we're going to keep it fair. <sighs> you really want me to go there? Because I got a lot of bad jokes about that. I can't put that on the internet. I'll probably get fired. Okay. <sighs> I had to call myself because I almost kept going. Okay, Man okay, so those are mandatory relationships. Uh, that's the first time I've ever had someone pull that one out. <laughs> Thanks. Threw me for a loop. It's going to be that kind of group, eh? Uh, cardinality constraints. Okay. It expresses the number of entities which another entity can be associated via relationship set. Sounds like a really complicated sense to say a mother can have many children. A child can only have one mother. That's what that sentence means. It just means that there, when you have a relationship between two kinds of objects or entities, there's certain rules. For example, theoretically, you can only ever have one current address. Where do you live right now? Mind you, it might be parking slot 2 instead of parking slot 5, but you're probably in lot 8 if you're living in your car. But you still have an address. It's whatever your, your piece of jet is. Um, but there's still a way to describe it. But on the other hand, if you've had more than one job, you have a one-to-many relationship with your his employment history. You've had many jobs. Cardinality constraints. This is the rule of how many are required. Usually the rule is zero or one. For example, a woman can have zero or more children, right? A child must have a mother, unless they're a clone. But a child can only have one mother, 
right? So the child must have a mother, but a woman doesn't necessarily have, need to have children. So minimum cardinality, if zero, then it's optional. If one or more, then it's mandatory. So. And maximum cardinality, the maximum number. This is something that's almost never used. Can you imagine if you said um, you can only ever have two historical jobs? You're not allowed to have ever worked anywhere else but two places max. So that's what that rule means. Nobody implements it. But the phrase maximum cardinality shows up here and there in the world. It just means you can actually apply a rule saying there cannot be more than X number of child records. Okay. I'm going to have a little picture on the screen in a minute. So, but this is review from last week with different words. Um, for binary relationships, it means two objects. You have a one-to-one, -one, so a manager heads one department at a time. A uh, department should have one manager, theoretically. One-to-many, an employee works in one department, or a department has more than one employee. Unless, you know, it's like where I work, where for the longest time our marketing department was one guy. He was also the manager. So I went. We have a very sales light organization. <laughs> uh, many to many. A teacher teaches many students, and a student can be taught by many teachers. So these are all examples you've used before. And once again, these are the little symbols we're going to be using. Now, if you notice the diamond here, that's relationship. That's our um, entity. The blue lines are the relationship types. So out of this whole slideshow, this is probably the one slide you really want to remember. And that's slide 10. You can't see the number on the screen, but I've, it's slide number 10. Uh, you'll probably want to file that for future reference. OK, so I'm going to do an example in a second on the screen to describe that each student can attend one school. Well, theoretically, as adults, we can attend multiple schools. But as most kids, they go to one school, right? If you're in high school, you go to your high school. If you're in grade school, you go to whatever grade school you're supposed to be at. Or if you're like my son, you don't go to any of them. But, you know, that's how it's supposed to work. Um, we also wish to indicate that each student attends exactly one school, therefore, this diagram. Student school. A school may or may not have students. Theoretically, they just built a brand new school and nobody's enrolled yet. The school exists, but there are no students. However, a school can have many students. So this is saying the school can have zero or many students. So this could be one students, two students, 300 students, or none. A student, on the other hand, has to go at least to one school, and at most, one school. So if we go back to this, this one, right? Mandatory one, optional many. That's without the little red arrows. So once again, a school can have many students or none at all. Totally, this side's totally optional. But once a student exists, it has to be assigned to a school. And they can only attend one school. Yes? Yeah, it's a little vague. The, the, the zero or many gets vague. And basically what that means is that you have an entity that can be a parent. And a, the parent may or may not have children. Right? So back to the woman example. Right? You're a woman. You have no children. Suddenly, 
You right now you have you can have zero or more children. Then you have a child. Suddenly, you have one or more children. Yeah, no, but yeah, but you get it. That's when it gets a little when you do the, the analysis and the diagramming. That's where you start thinking about the data. A school gets built. It doesn't have any students yet. It can have zero or more. Just like when they shut down a school. The school still exists. It's still in the books, but there's no more students at that school. But the school, it's, the school itself exists as an entity, but it has zero students. Well, with a department, there's still a spot called manager. It's just not assigned. And usually, if they turf a manager, depending on the size of the company, right? I mean, there's scale here also. When you talk about a, man, a department with a manager, if they fire a manager first thing in the morning, and they promote someone that afternoon, realistically, time-wise, there's no, there's no gap. If it's a small department where there, if there's only a manager and no employees, they're going to have to hire someone to replace it. That means that department exists without a manager. That was an example. Um, realistically, it should be that should be an optional two-way relationship. But that's the example that gets in the textbook. Is a manager has a department, a department has a manager, and they decided it was mandatory. In the real world, it's not, because it's possible. That, or you work for the government where you have four managers for one department. And then you have a deputy that manages the, the departments, right? Depending where you work, the rules are different. Therefore, you have to model the data based on the environment you're targeting. OK. Not necessarily. Um, you could have theoretically, it could be, you could have this as being one optional. So you could have a student that exists that's not assigned to a school. That means a student could have one school, but the school is optional. Which nowadays, the way the school system's going, that's becoming more and more of a thing where you have, even for high school kids, you got distance education. They're not registered against a given school, they're just registered against the school board. So in theory, you could have a student being at least no school, but at most one school. That means that they're only ever allowed to be registered against one school at a time. But even though they're registered against only one school at a time, it's optional that they aren't registered at a school. That's the theory. Uh, but that's you know defeating the point of this example. No, you design it to the target environment. So by that, in actual fact, let's go over here. Okay, you design it to the targeted environment. That means that even though you might be designing a diagram for a school board, maybe the diagram for the OCDSB would be different from the Catholic school board because maybe the rules are different. Data is. Um, Situational. Is that the right word? Yeah. Let's go with situational. That means that the data can change. The meaning of the data changes depending on the, the observer. Right? Whoever's observing the data and whoever's going to be using the data, one person may use it totally differently than somebody else. Therefore, what you end up trying to do is you find out what the best case use is for the mass that you're targeting, and you design to that. So if you get hired by a company and they want you to write an HR system, you're going to go with whatever the, how the company's rules are and whatever the laws are. But, you know, the laws plus the rules equals what you do. Other companies may have different rules. Therefore, the diagram would end up being different. Okay. Mandatory one, but no more than one. Well, yeah, that's what it means. It's mandatory one. Yeah, one. One, one. Right? 
Mandatory one, and at least one. At most one, sorry. At most one, at least one, and it's mandatory one. That means that you have to have one. That's mandatory. This means that this is optional. The zero means it's optional and that you can have multiple up here. So you can have zero or more. No. No, because then you're shooting yourself in the foot. There are things that there's only at least one, but at least two, and minimum two. Then all you're doing... <laughs> yeah, you're talking about scientific mo molecules. But you're talking about an oxygen molecule, but what happens if you go a carbon molecule? Or a strontium molecule? Therefore, it's a many-to-many -many relationship between the different kinds of, of elements that make it up. Therefore, you wouldn't code a database to one element because then you shot yourself in the foot for every other element. Considering they keep adding stuff to the periodic table, you'll be designing forever. All right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the circle means optional all the time. Yeah. Yes, you can only ever have the one. And if you have a crow's foot, one or more. And if it's a zero, it means it could be zero, one, or more. No. You have two symbols at each end and only ever two symbols at each end. Okay? All right. Now, the general steps are creating an ERD now that we've gotten past the little gross foot thing. The steps are as follows. You identify the entity, you identify their attributes, you identify the primary keys, and I'll redefine later what the primary keys are. You identify the relation between the entities. You identify the cardinality. Do you notice how far down that, that is? The cardinality? And then you draw it, and then you check it. It sounds stupid, but after you've drawn it, you might look at the picture and go, oh. Then you put it down, you know, you go to Starbucks, buy some ultra burnt coffee that tastes like sewage water. Get back to your diagram, drink it. Can't believe you just drank that coffee. Look at your diagram going, this is all wrong, and you start over. Right? Those are the steps. Really, there should be a step right here called take a break. Honestly, like I usually try to end my diagramming at the end of the day so I come back to it the next day after I've slept on it for a night. That way my brain comes in somewhat fresh-ish. You know, a couple of cups, cups of coffee later, the diagram makes sense again. But that's how you do it. Okay. Simplified version via picture. You model the entities and the attributes. You choose your primary keys. You do your relationships. Do your cardinalities and you check the model. So that's that big long list earlier, shortened down to the picture. These are the big steps. Um... And I'm going to skip the next slide because the next slide repeats what I just said. It's just, it's numbered instead. Okay, here's an example. A company has several departments. Each department has a supervisor and at least one employee. Employees must be assigned to at least one, but possibly more departments. At least one employee is assigned to a project, but an employee may be on vacation and not assigned to any projects. The important data fields are the names of the apartments, projects, supervisors, employees, as well as supervisor and employee number and a unique project number. Now, often when you start out talking to a customer, they'll actually give you a description that looks almost just like that. And then you hate them because there's not enough information. There really isn't. But one step to handle this situation is you identify the entities. So you highlight the words that correspond to entities. So you sit there with your little highlighter or in Word and you use a highlighting tool in Word or whatever. And you start highlighting words. A company has several departments. Each department has a supervisor. Notice that we're not repeating the highlighting, right? 
a department slash departments, supervisor, employee. So we're not going to repeat, highlight other words. Like if we already highlighted the word employee, you're not going to highlight employees because they're essentially the same thing. One's a plural, one's a singular. And then you go, at least one employee is assigned to a project, and then the rest of this, if you look at it, is noise for the time being. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the entities. What are the things that make up this description? Um, you guys remember your English writing skill classes? Or insert your own primary language skill writing classes, if anything? Where they teach you basic grammar about, you know, everything has a subject. And what's the uh, subject of the paragraph as opposed to the subject of the sentence? Because you shouldn't write a paragraph about more than one subject because it's bad writing. Uh, it gets confusing. This is a paragraph with one, two, three, four, five subjects in it. But this is what customers give you. It's actually very realistic. So you want to highlight the different bits and pieces until the point where you're no longer highlighting the same things. So you highlight the unique instances of everything that looks like a a unique identifiable entity. So then we can use a grid. Um, believe it or not, this is really old school. Um, a lot of people don't teach this method anymore. Why? I don't know, because it works. It's simple. It also assumes you're working on a piece of paper or on a whiteboard and, man, waste the trees uh, if you're using paper. You know, whiteboards work great for this too. So, if you use a relationship matrix like this, and essentially what you do is you draw each of the different entities I've identified going up and over. And then you start filling them in based on the sentences that were identified. Now, a department, if you go across, department, department, obviously it's not self-related. An employee is assigned to a department. A, a department is run by a supervisor. If you look, an employee belongs to a department and it works. And an employee works on a project. A supervisor runs a department and a project uses an employee. Those are action words that you identified based on the previous diagram, uh, the previous paragraph. And once we've done this, what we end up with is these key elements. And you could actually put on a piece of paper, on a whiteboard, on a boogie board, whatever you want to write with. And you end up with something that looks like this, where you identify all the entities and how are they connected to other entities. And you should be able to read them as a short sentence. If the sentence has more than five or six words, seven words, it's too complicated. Well, obviously, unless the entity has more than one word in it, like, you know. But in this case, a department is run by a supervisor. An employee belongs to a department. They're short in sentences that are easy to describe. If you can describe them that succinctly, you'll be able to diagram it. Theoretically, a supervisor is an employee. Once we start diagramming, it'll, it'll come out clear. But in this example, they're actually treating these supervisors as separate from the employees. Um, a good example of that would be um, well, let's actually let's use like the college here, right? The educational staff is separate from the administration staff. We're actually in two different bins, right? We've got the academic staff, and we've got the support staff, and we've got the management staff, and the administrative staff. And we're all in different bins. As far as HR is concerned, we're actually different creatures. And they're, we're treated differently based on what kind of creature we are. So based on their description, they're treating supervisors as being different creatures than employees. Maybe supervisors are full-time employees, and their employees are all part-timers. They just hired a bunch of people off the street temporarily. They're all temps. The supervisors make sure the good job gets done, but they hire un, you know, unskilled labor to move the boards. Uh, 
All right, so then you draw a rough ERD. So you want to put all the entities into rectangles. Okay, so somebody said these were good markers. Let's see if they are. A box is an entity. It's a thing. We can substitute this with the word. For example, employee. This is an entity. It's a thing. And then use diamonds and lines to represent the connections between the entities and the, the relationships. In here, this one doesn't have a diamond because they haven't drawn it in yet. Um, but if I turn around based on the example we just had, an employee works on a project. A department is run by a supervisor. Right? An employee belongs to a department. So that's the description similar to what's here. Or you could use different wording. Yes? No, no, this isn't. We're back. No, no, this is not a flow chart. Just because it's a diamond, it's not a flow chart. Um, you're getting confused with a standardized programming flow chart. This is a data diagram. Diamond means relationship, not decision. Yeah, that's cardinality later. An employee works on a project. That's usually what employees do. They work on something. They have a job. Okay? I use the word belongs to here. I could have used is assigned. Because then the word is assigned applies in both directions, right? A department is assigned an employee. An employee is assigned to a department. There's a few different ways to do this. Um, you tend to want to try to find the wording that applies in both directions. It's sometimes it's hard and it doesn't work. Yes. Yes. It has nothing to do with physical. It has nothing to do with logical. This is conceptual. This is the concept. And if we were to take the previous slide plus this slide, we end up with this slide. So back to our big paragraph, this is what we identified. A department is run by a supervisor. An employee works on a project. A department is assigned an employee or an employee is assigned to a department, depending which way you want to read it. That is a what they call a rough or very basic ERD. Yes. No, 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 no. It's just whatever makes your eyes happy. Uh, after a while, when you're dealing with more than four entities, it gets all over the place. We get to that when we start dealing with cardinality. Right now, um, what you end up wanting to do is, for now, you try to find wording that hopefully applies bidirectional. If not, you at least find the, the wording that applies, you know, at least in one direction. So, for example, a department is run by a supervisor. And so what some people will do is they'll put a slash here and put the word runs, supervisor runs department. Um, employee works on project. Project is worked on by employee. Um, 
essentially the point is you just want to explain the general concepts. Thus, it's a conceptual. Yes? Uh, the supervisor runs the department. That's all that we were given. Right, so right now what, what the problem you have when you're doing conceptual diagrams is you can only work with what you've been told. Don't assume. Because once you start running ahead, you might be assuming wrong. And you know what the saying about assuming is, right? When you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. Right? A-S-S-U-M-E. Don't assume. If they give you a paragraph, you work with that paragraph. And once you've diagrammed that, you present it back to them, say, this is what I understood of what you said. Say, well, no, you're missing this, this, and this. Then you get them to give you another paragraph that describes the bits that are missing. So then you can start plugging it in. It's an iterative process. Um, it's very, very difficult to get a diagram right on the first pass. Why? Because end users lie. Customers lie. They don't tell you the truth, and they don't tell you the whole thing. Yes? If you want to. That works also. Normally, at this stage, you actually want to try to be a little more descriptive than the word has. Because at that point, you're starting to imply uh, cardinality when you use the word has. When you're pre-cardinality stage, as, such as this, you're trying to describe the relationship between them, not how many of each do they have. Whereas with has, applies in, implies numbers. Whereas a department is run by a supervisor, there's not really an implication of a number in there. This one guy runs a department. Um, but yes, you could just go with has. Just depends on what you want to do. Okay. But then you fill in the cardinality. So see, as we're talking about, how do we know which thing things are going? It's the next slide. So we know based on the paragraph what we had, and I wish I could actually split the display across the two screens. So I could keep the paragraph up on one screen and have this stuff up on the other. A supervisor, the paragraph said, each department has one supervisor. Each supervisor has one department. Each employee can belong to one or more departments. An employee, each of the, each department must have at least one or more employees. So based on the paragraph, they're saying you cannot have a department unless you have an employee in that department. That's what the paragraph said. Each project must have at least one or more employees. That means that a project has to have someone working on it. Otherwise, it's a dead project. Each project can have zero or more projects. So in theory, you'd have an employee that's on vacation and he's not working on anything. They have zero projects, but they could be working on a project. So now we're back to our little cardinality things, right? Remember earlier when I had the little diagrams up on the screen? Uh, this is actually a slide where it explains the diagrams, the symbols a little better. Now that we had the sentences in front of previously, now you can look at what these words mean. It makes a bit more sense. Each instance of A is related to a minimum of zero and a maximum of instance of B. So that's what that symbol means. The other, the other one, the A to B, each instance of B is related to a minimum of one and a maximum of one of A. Then you got the, whatever, the, the many's. Minimum of one and a maximum of, of many. So this is saying that at least one, but they can have many. This one turns around and says each instance of B is related to a minimum of zero of A and a maximum of many. In other words, the maximum is at least one or more, right? Maximum of many, N, N number of relationships. So if we turn this around to our little diagram we had earlier, same symbols. If we remember what they said, a department is run by a single supervisor. A supervisor can only run one department. Department supervisor, one-to-one. -one. A department requires at least one supervisor and can't have one-to-one supervisor. A supervisor cannot be a supervisor without a department, and they can only ever work on one department. An employee can work on zero or more projects. 
This means that they can be either on one project, zero projects, or working on three different projects at the same time. On the other hand, a project must have an employee. But they can have more than one employee, but they must have an employee. This is must have. At least one, but they can have many. And then if you look at it going the other way, an employee can belong to more than one department, but they have to belong to at least one department. And a department must have at least one employee, but they can have many employees. That's a crow's foot cardinality. Um, there's actually, this diagram shows every different combination of it. And it's actually very clear, because if you go look at the diagram, and you look at slide 25 as opposed to slide 27, it describes what the little pictures are saying in words. Uh, once you understand the symbology, this is easier to read than that. Which is the goal? Yes? Well, the reason we do, he asked almost the same question just earlier. No, it's fine. Let's repeat that. How come there's no connection between supervisor and project? Because the paragraph that we were given did not describe it. You cannot assume a relationship exists if you have not been told. Otherwise, you make an ass out of you and me. Yes? Each department has a supervisor. Has assumes mass mandatory. Otherwise, they'd say it would have been worded like, um, we're a bit further down where a, uh, at least one employee is assigned to a project, but an employee may be on vacation and not assigned. And unless they qualify that there isn't one, if they use the word has, it assumes mandatory. Yes. Because they're assuming the day, I don't know, because it assumes the company is, you're diagramming the internals of that company. If you work for a large company like De Beers International, where they have, it's a, an umbrella of companies, then you'd have one level out from that. Um, actually, here, I'll even draw it for you on the board, but there was one other question. Well, normally what happens is I tend to ask questions for our diagramming, especially when I get something that big. But sometimes I don't get to talk to the customer. Basically, our, actually, I almost never get to talk to the customer. Uh, what happens is the customer talks to our technical sales guy. He interprets what they've said. He lets a bunch of questions and flesh out what they've said. Then he passes me. Usually it's like a page, not a paragraph. With point form. So he's distilled it out of sentences into a point form list. And then I'll look at it and say, okay, some of these things don't make sense. Can you clarify on this? Then we'll do it back and forth once or twice. And then I do my first diagram. But if I was just starting out, I'd take that first sheet and go with it. Because I might not know enough about what I'm doing. Because I haven't done it enough to know that I'm missing something. So then you end up spending a lot of time back and forthing. Once you've done it for a few years, you know, you tend to kill a little bit right at the beginning because you realize Tim, your sentence makes no sense. Yeah. But what I mean, the employee level is like, who's a super... Well, I mean, usually you have a self-referencing table at that point. Uh, that's called a unary relationship. Um... And essentially, you end up with, you don't have a supervisor thing. You just have another relationship from employee to departments saying that's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. That's optional at one end, saying this employee is a supervisor. The, well, if you have different descriptions, what you end up having to do is you have to negotiate with the customer to see which one's the real answer. You have to play detective. 
And in diagramming and database design, you play detective an awful lot. Um, if anybody here's ever played uh, Professor Layton, you learn all about the details. Um, it's about identifying all the details and trying to extract as much details out of the end user or the customer as possible before you start. And if you have conflicting things, then you send it back to them before you even start. Don't waste your time if you have conflicting stories, unless they don't understand it. It's, oh, it's entirely possible they don't know what the heck's going on. Um, we know with smaller companies or a lot of these uh, modern, loosely generated companies, sometimes people don't actually know who reports to who. Then it's up to the management of the company to make decisions exactly what the structure is. Yes? Uh, no. An employee may or may not have a project, but a project must have an employee. Okay? Now, earlier somebody said, well, what about if there's a company? On and on and on and on. That's why the company wasn't included in the diagram. Because the company has a relationship to everything. Usually what happens is you end up wanting to identify one upper connection and connect to that. Um, so for example, you'd also have projects down here also connected to the company. So this project belongs to that company, this supervisor belongs to that company, this employee belongs to that company. But if you start throwing in the company into the diagram, you end up with a big can of worms where you could theoretically have a project for one company being supervised by someone from a different company supervising employees from a third company, right? So then you end up having other relationships that you have to manage. And that's done at the application level at that point because it gets too complicated to try to get the database server to take care of it. The database server is really clever, but it's also really dumb. It's only as smart as, you know, yes. Yes. Because that's the standard. That's how it's done. <laughs> yes, why do you need it? Because in the 1970s, somebody said, this is how this diagram is done. If you want to change how it's done, that's great. As long as whoever you work for accepts it, that's fine. That's the standard. When you talk about conceptual diagram, and that's what Chen said, literally. Um, one of the designers, the original designers on diagramming, is, I don't remember his first name, his last name was Chen. That's how he said it was done. That's how it's done. Okay, other examples, really quick. Um, just show the cardinality. An employee claims a dependent. A dependent is claimed by an employee. <coughs> this one didn't have room for the diamonds, but essentially it's showing how the relationships work if you're going to use things other than has. Okay, now, the next step is something called the primary keys. And a primary key, do you guys remember how I described it last week, what a primary key is? A primary key is a unique attribute that identifies a single instance of an entity. In this room, you all have a student number. That is your primary key as far as the college is concerned. The next step in diagramming your database is to um, identify the primary keys. So, for example, in a department, you don't want two different departments called the same thing. So we can, for now, for now, we can say the department name is a primary key because you don't want repeated departments. Can you imagine if a company had two different sales departments? They both called themselves sales. And then somebody called up and said, can you transfer me to the sales department? Well, which one do you want? Sales A or sales B? You can't call two departments by the same name. 
In the paragraph, we identified that the supervisor has a supervisor number, and he's identified by a supervisor number. Boom. Pro we also identified that employees have an employee number, and the projects have a project number. That was actually at the end of the paragraph. <laughs> I can go back to the paragraph if you'd like, so we can highlight that. Yes. Yeah, you. Yes, it's possible. I belong to more than one department. Some of the people work at only one department. But the way they described it is any employee has to belong to at least one department. Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, when we start getting to the logical diagrams, which based on my watch will be next week, this over here, the many, many, gets resolved into uh, another table. When you have a many, many relationship, it gets resolved to, in the logical diagram, it gets broken out to a third object. A, this one here is a single connection. This one here has multiple connections going in both directions. That would end up being, when you have a many to many like this, you end up creating like what's called an associative entity, which is, you know, another entity. But they don't show up at the conceptual level because you don't need a make-believe entity to describe the concept. <coughs> right? You might need make-believe stuff to make it make sense logically. Just like zero. Right? Sometimes we need zero. Zero is not really a real number, but, you know, we need zero. It's a concept. It's a logical concept but it's, you know, a concept. So essentially what we do is we identify the primary keys at this point, and hopefully in the paragraph they gave you stuff that helps identify. If they give you an entity and they give, didn't give you a description how you can identify that entity, you say, okay, how do you identify your supervisor? Oh, we give them a badge number. Okay, that's their primary key. Oh, well, how about the projects? They didn't tell you how you identify a project. So, oh, it's not the project name. Or maybe we have a project number. Then you use that as your primary key, at least for now. Okay, big wall of text. Identifying the attributes. So after you've identified the primary key, so how you're going to uniquely identify each of the instances. I already did it for you guys, student number. I don't know anything else about you, but you all have a student number. I can identify you by calling out a number, and you should theoretically pop up after you've checked your student card, theoretically. In this step, when you identify the attributes, is we try to identify and name all the attributes essential to the system. Now, do you notice I said the word essential? Which ones are absolutely necessary? Because when you're doing a conceptual diagram, you don't want to grab all the nitty-gritty detail yet. You want to know what's necessary to identify the stuff. Um, so at this point in time, normally, You'll receive files, or examples, invoices, or receipts, or packing lists, or order forms. And you will look at these documents, and you'll start identifying the nitty gritty details. They might show you a piece of paper that has to do with HR, that little piece of paper that they have that identifies an employee to HR. There may be, you know, pieces on that that you haven't been told, but they've now given you documents to match it. So, what you end up doing is you cross out the stuff. In actual fact, next week I actually go through this process, literally on the, on the screen. I go through this process. Um, you cross out which aren't going to be transferred to the new system. So, for example, if you have a form and it has the word signature on it, cross it out. Why? That's not something you transfer to the, to the database. You shouldn't keep an actual digital copy of the person's signature. That's kind of wrong. Um, constant, constant information, for example, your company name and your address, the company you work for and your address, that is something that is constant. It's well, theoretically constant. It shouldn't change regularly. That is something you don't store in the database because it doesn't change. You might store it in a settings table somewhere or it's part of a configuration file, but it's not part of the everyday run of the data. Um, 
Anything else that's left are the stuff you need to keep. So when you think about an invoice, you think about the invoice date, the invoice number, uh, who sold it, you know, where's it being shipped to, who was the customer. That's all stuff you'd circle because these are things you need to track for the invoice. Um, once you've done that, then you go to the people that actually use the system and say, did I get this right? Does this make sense to you? If you're really lucky, your customer will actually put you in touch with your end users when you're lucky, um, which means that you go around with your form to, you know, you go talk to the lady in accounting or the guy in shipping or whomever it happens to be and say, this is the form that they gave me. This is what I identified. Any of this, did I miss anything important? And they'll say, see that code right there? We haven't used that in 10 years. Oh, scratch that off. See that field over there you scratched off? You shouldn't have scratched that off because it's something we just brought in. It does vary even though you thought it didn't. So you talk to the end user and they will help you identify your bits and pieces. Um, now, in our little paragraph, the only attributes they indicated were the names of the departments, project supervisors and employees, as well as their numbers and the project number. So what we'd end up doing then is we want to map the attributes. So we've identified each of the attributes. We want to map them to the entities. Make sure we're connecting them to the right things. Otherwise, you're giving attributes to things that don't apply. For example, you have a laptop and you accidentally give it a date of birth. Well, technically, it's got a manufacturing date, but you know, it's not the same thing as a date of birth. Um, sometimes what happens if you have attributes left over, that means that maybe you missed an entity somewhere along the way. So you've taken all the attributes on your piece of paper, you've mapped them to your diagram, and you still have six, entity, six attributes left on your piece of paper going, well, shit. No, really, that's pretty much what, that's close to what comes out of my mouth at that point. And I look at it and I go, oh, snap, I got to go, I'm missing something. So then I go pay a visit once again to the customer saying, where does this crap come from? And they'll say, oh, yeah, no, 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 there's this, this one thing that you don't see that's back here. Ah, uh, this one entity, the guy that sh sits at the back of shipping that folds boxes all day. It's the hidden boxing guy. The guy sits at the back and he just makes up boxes all day. We don't actually have one of those. So I'm just using that as an example. <laughs> well, you know, if you work for a big enough company, there probably is a guy that sits in the back and all he does is make boxes all day. Amazon, think about it. <laughs> so you got a box, you got a guy whose job is putting in boxes, but it's because there was like a, uh, an entity, an attribute that talked about boxer. What the heck's a boxer? Oh, it's the guy at the back, right? So then you end up mapping your missing attributes. You might need an extra entity or something else. Like I said, this is iterative. You go back and forth between you and the customer and the end user. And sometimes you don't have a customer and end user. You have you. Then you have a problem because, you know, you might be missing stuff because, you know, you're working on by yourself on your own project. And you may be missing important pieces of information. Um, at that point, you either want to find someone you can sit down with a beer and say, can you take a look at this? Or, you know, you go have a walk, get some really gross Starbucks and come back and drink it. Go to Timothy's. Um, it's not burnt. <laughs> um, but yeah, you identify this stuff and you add them in. So, now, this is an attributes matrix. We identified the attributes, we identified the entity, and do we just so happen that we did it over two columns? Really, this could be just one long thing, but it's kind of hard to put it on a slide that way. So you have an attribute and an entity. You just basically want to map the attributes to each of the entities. So then you end up with something that looks like this. See, our diagram is growing. There's shit being added to it. And it gets too small to read from further than three feet away, which is, is good if you have the slideshow in front of you so you can zoom in. But here we go. A supervisor, actually, I'm going to turn the camera so the camera actually picks me up. Okay. Let's go with the supervisor. Okay. Supervisor is an entity. It's a square box. Relationships are a diamond. Attributes are a circle. Right? Our three primary, you know, three primary shapes. 
Circles. Do you notice one of them is underlined and one is not? Underlined is primary key. Any attributes that are not underlined are just regular attributes. They're just things that identify. Like such. So this is a primary key. Underlined, not underlined, it's just a name. Okay. I'm actually going to finish on this slide and skip the last slide because that's going to be for next week anyways. Um, so now you want to take a look at the diagram from the viewpoint of a system user or owner. Is everything clear? Does it make sense? If it makes sense, good job. If something doesn't make sense, you need to revisit and have another conversation with your end users or your system administrators or whatever. Check your cardinality pairs. Make sure the rules make sense. You know, a department can have more one or more employees or it might not have more than one employee. Who knows? And then you double check all the attributes and then you double check all your papers and you go, everything is there. Everything that is mandatory is there. Whatever is necessary is there. Now, there are a few things in here that aren't displayed in this first set of examples. And I don't have a slide for those. And those are called the... Um, Wow, that's a really good marker. You can't erase it. I'm just going to go turn on the light. Okay. So we think about a customer. There are things we use to identify a customer. For example, we could have a customer number to uniquely identify the customer. We have a customer name. So far, this looks pretty much like what I had up on the screen. Address. Do you notice I put it in curlies? Can somebody take a guess why I put this in curlies? Yeah, it's composite. So we got three people lifted their hands and one person blurted. You guys won. <laughs> so normally there's two ways of handling this. If you want to just stop at the basic conceptual, you can just leave it as is. If you want to go to what they call a detailed conceptual, which is you know kind of defeating the point of the conceptual, but you can go to what they call a detailed conceptual. And that's how you draw it. Well, yeah, I'm just using the word street to identify like your, you know, one, two, three, some street. Because, you know, the more I write on the board, the worse my handwriting gets. So I keep it nice and short and sweet. So this is what they call a composite or a compound, depending, you know, what wording you want to use. This is a com uh, composite attribute. This attribute is made up of other attributes. Therefore, depending on what level you want to do this diagram and how big a printer you have, you may want to stop here and just leave it with curlies and just say to the customer, by the way, this implies this. And they go, well, I don't understand. Then you come back with that so they understand. Um, that's, this is the only one that was not addressed in today's slideshow. All right. Now, whew, 
that was a lot. The what I'm going to cover next week. Oh, I meant to say that the CSI is a suggestion, right? I don't know if you guys understand what CSIs actually are. A CSI is not the um, I got to choose my wording carefully here. The absolute truth. Uh, why? Because things adjust depending on you know. If I don't have time to cover something in some week, it's going to go to the next week. If I just so happen to blow through something really fast, I might bring in content from the next week in. So, you know, th th this is what I plan to cover in that time frame, not necessarily, you know, don't hold it against me if it's not exact. The CSI is not a legal binding contract like the course outline is. The course outline says I must cover these things for you, and I will. The CSI is, here's my plan of how I hope to accomplish this before the end of the term. Uh, but the dates on it are pretty good. So that being said, uh, next week, we're going to convert this to a logical diagram. That one's really fast. I can cover the conversion from conceptual to logical, usually in 20, 15 minutes. So that's quick. Um, and after that, we're going to talk about the physical diagram aspects. And then we're, we've actually achieved the point where we're actually doing real database design. Yes. Yes. The, the, I'm, I know, and I got. I, obviously, I'm going to have to push it back because, I mean, what time is it? I got time. All right, guys, you've convinced me. Okay. Uh, do I even have a slideshow for that? <laughs> do I have a slideshow for that? Give me a minute. Those guys that were packing up. Oh, uh, yo. Okay, no. Okay, I don't need a slideshow for this. Conceptual. I'm just going to aim my little camera over here. Logical. So I'm going to take this and turn it into a logical diagram. Oh god, this marker sucks. Conceptual, logical. We know the customer is the primary key. We identify it in here. We can use all the same naming we have over here, but now it's rep represented as a table. The only other thing that's missing that we had up here was the many-to-many. Uh, if I bring that back, uh, let's go with this one, this, right? If we take, say, department and employees, okay? Now, I hope my camera's picking that up. Sort of. Actually, earlier we identified the name as the primary key. We had the employee number as the primary key and their name. And we said that if an employee can belong to one or more departments,
number. And these are marked as being foreign key. Primary key, foreign key. This field gets its value from a primary key from another table. When I do the, the logical or the physical next week, it'll make more sense. Um, the employee number from this table gets its value from the number from the employee. The primary key here is the parent of the foreign key here. So when you see this kind of structure, where you have a many to many on both sides, let's take my camera over here for a second so it's clear and focused on. <laughs> So I don't have a slideshow to match this. The um, it becomes a third table. So when you have a many to many over there, it becomes a third table. This hold that thought. This is known as an associative. I swear I misspelled that entity. Right? So these are normal entities. This is an associative entity. Its purpose in life is to associate two other entities. Its entire purpose in life is to identify the connection between two other tables. That was you back there. Yeah. Well, the values would be the same. Normally, the fields would be called the same. It's just when I'm writing up on the board, I have limited space and handwriting capabilities. Um, I'd rather keep words short so I don't have terrible, like, absolutely... A little easier to see. <laughs> so that way, normally what you'd hear here, you'd have this called the department name or employee number. When I convert this next week to a physical diagram, uh, there's some really big rules that kick in about naming. And I explained the best why. That was what I was supposed to cover at the end of last week's lecture. I'm going to move it to the start of next week's lecture. Yes? Yeah, well, the, the big difference between them is um, the compound attributes have been broken out. The attributes are contained inside the entity. So this big thing becomes this nice, neat little table. Uh, on here, you don't use, some people will still put the underline on here just for a quick comparison that it's a primary key. So they take, like, you know, sometimes a different color or, and they'd go, like this. And then when they get really clever, when they get really clever, they underline the foreign keys in a different color. But not all the software supports that. So if you're doing it by hand, I recommend use as many colors as you can. Why? Colors pop, right? When you're using software, you're limited to whatever the software supports. Yes? Yes? Well, no. The, what's happening is a department can have one or more entries in employee department. An employee can have one or more entries in employee department. The way this is set up, and you don't see it here, this is what's called a compound primary key, which I'm not a fan of. I tend to stay away from those because they're just bad. Um, it's hard to explain, but I'll, you know, it's not drawn like this. But that's your primary keys, the two fields put together which means that an employee cannot belong to the same department twice when it's set up that way. So what happens is a department can have many employees, an employee can have many departments, 
by doing a lookup in here. No, no, that's a list of employees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you look at the actual data, the data would look something like this. Time to get up. That's the sound my daughter uses for alarm clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm so used to hearing it. That's what the data inside looks like. This identifies the structure. This is actually what the data inside would look like. Like that. So that's so that's what I don't have enough colors of markers to do this so that it's visually identified as something separate. But essentially the employees would look like that inside. But that's how the pieces you use to identify the different bits and pieces. So the diagrams allow you to identify the bits and pieces that describe the things, not the things themselves. Because if you actually diagram something and you actually diagram the thing itself, for example, you create a table called Bob. Then you hire Frank, so then you create a table called Frank. It's a lot of maintenance. Whereas you already have a table that has room for Bob and room for Frank and room for, you know, for Chad and room for whatever else. Yeah, this, this is an instance. Instance. These are types. And this is your entity. So that actually covers that whole example, the whole instance types and whatever from last week. It, I told you last week it would make more sense if you had a diagram in front of you. That is the truth. But it's, you know, you got to get enough of the verbiage in. So I'm going to take my little camera for a walk again so I can get a good angle on that, on that board. So for whoever wasn't here or whoever left, they <laughs> have the example on the video. Okay, like I said earlier, I can cover the law, the conceptual to logical in less than 20 minutes. I did it in 10. Depends on the software you use. Some of the software can take this and you hit a button and it makes this for you. Uh, ERD Plus is theoretically capable of doing this and it sometimes succeeds. Uh, it's web based, right? It's basic, it's simple. If you're using a piece of software like Power Designer, which costs $17,000 for the cheapest seat you can buy, it does it sometimes. No, just saying, like, depending on how complex your attributes are, it doesn't always succeed properly and then you end up still having to tweak it by hand. Yeah, yeah, usually you end up having to do it manually or at least you need to double check, make sure it's right. Um, you know, should you always trust everything your computer does for you? Not necessarily. It's like that old saying, right? Trust but verify. Trust it, but make sure they're actually doing what they're supposed to do. That's like having kids. Trust your kids, you got to verify they're actually not throwing the garbage behind their bed. And that's basically what the software does. It'll do this, but you need to verify they did it correctly. Okay, any last minute questions? Otherwise you do get to bolt and run away. Going once, going twice, oh, under the wire. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, go. Okay, the big advantage is if you fire an employee and you delete their record, you don't end up with this risk of accidentally nuking a department. Okay, let's just say a supervisor supervises a department that's also an employee. What happens if you delete the supervisor, but it's actually the parent of the department for whatever reason, because somebody did something stupid to their design? You could theoretically nuke the, the, the department, and then uh, you'd nuke all the employees too, because everything's cross-connected. Use the associative entity to allow you to manage it properly and simply. There is actually a better way than this, um, and I 
well, I can't say it's this plus extra. But this is the way you resolve a many-to-many -many relationship. You use an associative entity. That's just the, 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 the um, best practice. Three?